start recording. All right, can you see the screen, Shannon? Yes. Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to the RoboFest Online World Championship Exhibition event for the Senior Division. My name is Elmer Santos. I'm the Assistant Director for uh, RoboFest. Thank you so much for joining us um, today. This is our schedule. Um, we're gonna have some opening remarks, some introductions, and then proceed right into the uh, uh, um, team presentations. Um, we estimate we'll be done a little bit after uh, 9.15 um, US Eastern time. Thank you so much teams for checking in. Um, yeah, this online format for exhibitions is challenging and, and um, we've got some, uh, yeah, some sophisticated setups uh, that everyone will see. So thank you so much teams for uh, your patience and your, um, your, your effort. RoboFest is a program of Lawrence Technological University. Uh, at this time, we have a welcome message from uh, Lawrence Tech. Welcome to the 2022 RoboFest Online World Championship. I'm Dr. Srini Kamampadi, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Lawrence Technological University in Southfield, Michigan, USA. This year marks our 23rd RoboFest season and our third online world championship. We are proud that we have been able to continue to bring RoboFest to the world to these extraordinary times and we will continue to be committed to a competition-based learning environment, however that looks in the future. RoboFest is all about STEM learning. Success at RoboFest requires the mastery of multiple STEM and computer science subjects, which in turn drives preparation for college classes and high-tech careers. Additionally, RoboFest teaches students to develop essential skills such as problem solving, teamwork, creativity, and communication. Thank you for your participation in this online competition. I commend all of the teams and students here for being active learners and pioneers who are eager to master technologies for the future. As you may know, Lawrence Technological University was founded in 1932 with the support of Henry Ford. At that time, Ford's famous Model T factory was at the forefront of an industrial revolution that changed the world. Likewise, we are today at such a forefront of new technologies. LTU and RoboFest are paving the way. Someday, I hope you will join us here at Lawrence Tech to continue to do the excellent work you are already doing with LTU's RoboFest. Your efforts are advancing science and technology for solving real world problems. At this time, I would like to thank all the teachers, coaches, mentors, and parents. You make this program possible for our students. Without you, teams do not exist. Additionally, I'd like to thank all of the inspirational site hosts and international directors who have organized local qualifying competitions or are sending teams to 2022 RoboFest online world championship events. Finally, we cannot give enough thanks to our local judges and LTU judges and the staff for their dedication. In closing, I wish all of you luck with your endeavors today and hope you have a great connected learning and collaboration experience through our 2022 RoboFest online world championship competition. Thank you. Thanks again to Lawrence Technological University for their support.
And thank you to uh, RoboFest 2022 sponsors. Thank you so much. This would not be possible without your um, generous support. Um, exhibition is one of a series of world championship events for uh, RoboFest. Please join us uh, for the remaining events, which will be the game events in two weeks. Also, we'll be having our um, award ceremony on May 21st. Again, my name is Elmer Santos. I am the uh, RoboFest Assistant Director. Also with us today, um, Dr. Christopher Cartwright, the Director of RoboFest, and um, Shannon Polonis, a RoboFest Coordinator. We would also like to welcome our teams. We have seven enthusiastic teams here with us today. Thank you so much for coming. And also we have our judges that would like to introduce um, our judges. Uh, first, we've got um, John Resner. Oh, hello. Uh, my name is John and I've been doing this for over a decade. So good luck, everybody. Thank you, John. Okay, next up, uh, we have um, Mrs. Pam Sparks. Hello, friends. Uh, my name is Pam Sparks, and I am a Michigan educator. I've been educating STEM programs in Michigan for over 30 years now. I'm a huge um, Great Lakes advocate, and I'm currently developing a zoology pathway on the Detroit River in Detroit. And I uh, am also a huge RoboFest fan. I coach teams and I help Shannon coordinate in the RoboFest office. I just was looking at the list of names and I love the creativity. I'm looking forward to some great presentations. All right, thank you, Pam. And then uh, last but not least, we've got Professor uh, Destiny. Hello everyone, uh, this is Destiny. I'm from the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science here at Lawrence Tech and welcome to you all, um, best in, in the competition. Thank you. So once again, thank you to our judges. Um, this program and the uh, judge biographies will be available uh, on our RoboFest World Championship page. Okay, just want to briefly go over the process for um, judging and determining winners. Um, teams were required to provide video as well as source code. Um, a code inspector will recommend points for the uh, programming. Judges have been selected by the Lawrence Tech RoboFest office. Um, at the competition, we will give the microphone um, to each team, put them on the stage, and each team will have four minutes to present and demonstrate their projects. Uh, afterwards, judges will ask questions for um, about two minutes. Uh, teams must use English for communications. Um, however, uh, translation is allowed where, where needed. And then um, lastly, uh, judges may ask additional questions to teams um, after the event within 24 hours, and then teams have 24 hours to uh, reply. Okay, uh, this brings us up to the uh, group photo. So we'd like everyone to uh, turn on the cameras and come close. All right. So waiting for a few to yeah. get set for their photo. Kind of look at your profile picture, make sure it looks like you want it to look. I think Eagle Four is with Eagle Three, is that true? So the only team that we're missing are the ladies from Saudi Arabia. Can you turn on your camera, Dania? One of the cameras so we can get a, a good picture. There they are. Hey. Excellent. Wonderful, wonderful. What a great looking group. Okay. Eric, you can get in there too. 
There he is. <laughs> there we go. Okay, three, two, one. Robofest. <laughs> Robofest, one more. Here we go. Three, two, one. Robofest. Good luck, everyone. All right. Um. Oh yeah, just would like to note there's been a slight change in the order. Uh, hopefully, teams are aware. Um. We're going to start with uh, Aerobots and then Cornhole Railgun and then Gig and Trolls will be last. So hopefully that makes sense. We're going to start with um, Aerobots and then Cornhole, then Eagle 3, Eagle 4, uh, CDS, J5, SES, then PLKCL, SCMC, Robotic, robotic Team, and then lastly will be uh, Gigantros. Um, and yeah, okay. Uh, Shannon, do you want to explain how um, the process sure. works? Sure. How how we're going to do this is right now we are going to move all of the teams except Aerobots back into the attendees side. Um, all of you are now marked as um, the team, so everyone with the team with an asterisk. Um, will be on, on hold, basically. You'll go in, you'll see everything, but you won't be part of the screen at this time. So the Aerobots will be the only group. And then when the Aerobots are done and the judges have asked all their questions and the, they, they've completed their part of it, we will move the Aerobots back and then we'll move the next team, which would be the Cornhole Railgun in, et cetera, down the line. So each team will just have, it'll just be the judges and the team in the panelist view um, for that presentation time. So at this point, um, Pam, if you can help me start at the bottom um, and I'll start at the top. We're gonna move all of the teams except Aerobots um, back to the attendees side. All right, everyone just uh, yeah, give us a minute to do that. I don't think I have host rights, so maybe Elmer. I did. Can... I did. Did give you co-host, so a minute ago. You might need to accept it. So you, That's all right. I can. I, there's not that many. I can. Are, are you saying you need? You want to update the team, uh, the order, the order? Yes, the team oh. order will be. Um, Aerobots will be first. Aerobots will be first. If, if it is if it is not much of a, uh, a worry, each of us can just screenshot and then label them in front of our in front of us. Like if you if you if if you can maybe if it's gonna yeah, yeah we'll we'll announce the um the numbers. We'll, we'll make sure everyone knows which which team. Yeah, so I don't think you should waste. Uh, you should uh, bother yourself uh, doing it if you do. Okay, so I'm going to stop my video. So I'm not on the screen as well. So just the judges and the team. Um, Eric, I'm gonna move your... Um, okay. So also too, that I will be running a four minute timer. Um, since we do have a little bit extra time today, we're not gonna hold you to exactly four minutes. So if I say time is up, then we will ask you to wrap it up. Um, but we will, like I said, allow time um, for the Q and A as well as translations if required. So I will be running the timer. Um, I'll still give you the, when, when you're ready to start, just go ahead and start talking and I'll start the timer at that point and I'll let you know when the four minutes is up. So um, then we'll, we'll turn it over to the judges and they'll have their time for questions and answers. So whenever you are ready, Aerobots, you are free to start your presentation. Uh, okay, uh, can you hear us? 
Yes. Okay. So we are ready to start. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, I am Tonyo. Hi, I am Daniel. And we are our robotics from Toluca, Mexico, with the ID 2895-4. And we are here to present to you our project for RoboFest Exhibition 2022. This project is an introduction to vision systems using LabVIEW. The project is scope of the fish driver. Mm -hmm. Introducing the vision system, image processing, and communication protocols show a fun and interactive project for the kids. And the STEM learning goals for the project is the image processing using linear algebra, image color processing with RGB model, image morphology techniques, communication protocols, and motor control using PWM. Now, Everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing it is stupid. I'll be ready So we gave the fish the opportunity to conquer the land. That's why we the reason uh, we create the fish driver. This project is divided in three main systems: the vision system, navigation system, and communication system. The first model is a vision system. The first step in this model is to acquire an image. Then we apply an RGB model to create a binary image. Then we define our target using different morphology techniques. At the end, we can track our target. The process image cannot be used as an input for the control of the navigation system. The second model is the navigation system. The robot structure is all built of aluminum. The powertrain assembly is a battery and the motors. And the control module is the Myreon. And this gives us the navigation base of image tracking. The robot moves depending on the position in the fish of the tank. Now, our last system. The last system is a communication system. In this, we first set up a network, then we configure our Wi-Fi camera on the top of the robot, then we connect the Mario to this network, and, the, and also we connect the computer. This gives us a wireless communication that gives the project more freedom and a more range of movements. Now, the product roadmap. We have the real-time vision acquisition and image processing, drive control based on vision system outputs, wireless connection setup between systems. And with all of this, we have a full autonomous working system. Now, while I was explaining that, my friend Daniel was controlling the robot using the security override. This allows us to prevent that the fish goes in a into danger and it stays uh, safe every time. But we can also switch to the camera on the top of the road that, uh, that is watching the fish. Now the fish is controlling the robot. The robot is moving depending on the position of the fish, as you can see in the bottom left. And now it uh, goes in a danger zone. So we bring it back. We bring it back, back with the camera. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Time for QA. Um, hello. Uh, great project. So um, when did you? realize you needed an override system for your robot drive, for your fish driver? Uh, there was some occasion that the fish run into a wall or went to jump over a step. Mm -hmm. That's why we have the override, the security override. How long did it take you to add that part, that feature to the program? Um, basically, it's just another input 
from the camera. So it is really simple. Um, like <laughs> in the first week, but I don't know. <laughs> Okay, so I have to say I love your lower thirds. Very good graphic there on your screen that we're seeing on our end. Uh, and I, I do have to ask, being a biologist, is what is the purpose of the fish? Are you is does it have anything to do with like fish identification, or the fish is just your um, like your canary in the coal mine? It's your example organism. Okay, uh, the fish is now for a um, fun and interactive project for everyone to learn a little bit of mission system. But the, but the true uh, purpose of this project is to be applied in different uh, situations like the medical situation and controlling uh, wheelchairs for paralytics with the iris and more application like that, like uh, autonomous navigation in vehicles. Okay, yeah, very great application of using animals to um, improve our technologies. Thank you, nice job. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, please. How difficult was it for you to do this? Because uh, um, is it because you you use the fish as a remote control, right? And with that, I'm asking, how difficult was this project? <laughs> Uh, before, before this project, we developed other visions project based in the same principle, but I think the most difficult challenge in this specific project was the wireless communication, the connection between the Wi-Fi camera and the Mario and the computer between uh, only Wi-Fi network. All right, thank you. It's at the end of the question and answers. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, at this time, we're thank going you. to move you back into the attendee side and bring the Cornhole Railgun team in. There they are. You you have to you have do to our other device. device. Okay, got this, it. This is the laptop. Laptop, laptop, laptop. Got it. Okay, whenever you're ready, I will start the timer when you start your presentation. Yeah. We still need the cameras on, right? Sorry. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Why is that's it okay? Up? That's okay. Well, yeah, that's yeah. No, no rush. Up. Yeah, well, let's make sure everything's right before we start. Yeah. Reverse cameras. All right. Did you got good uh, video now? Yes. Okay. Audio check. Good. Okay. All right. I think we're ready. Tell us when to start. Whenever they start, I will start the timer. Hi, I'm Nick. And I'm Maria. And we are Team Smart Labs. We built this cornhole railgun to, to learn about projectile physics and to play against a robot. We thought that the applications uh, with projectile physics can be used in ballistics and sports. We thought that this was a great way to show that physics is fun and that we can um, learn projectile motion. Cornhole is a fun backyard game that has recently been growing in popularity. 
It is played by two teams, which alternate throwing bags onto a board. Each bag on the board is one point, and each bag on the ho- in the hole is three points. First to 21 wins. We know that many robots can play against humans in mental games, such as chess, go, or even Jeopardy. We thought, why not a physical game? Cornhole would be the perfect example to show that projectile motion is fun and we can play cornhole. Here we have our four bungee cords that hold the elastic potential energy in the system. They wrap around these rollers and connect to a nylon cord through this adapter. The nylon cord is then tensioned with the spool, which is powered by a DC motor and a 320 to one ratio gearbox with an encoder. Here we have our over-centered trigger mechanism that reliably holds the cart in place. When the cart is released, the uh, uh, elastic potential energy in the system is converted into kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy in the cart and the bag. The bag then flies off and we need these brakes to absorb the excess kinetic energy in the cart. This was the trick we used to find the height. You know, the length is 231. So we know the height must be 231 sine of theta. Calculating, um, calibrating the launch was not easy. We had to uh, set angles from between 30 and 60 degrees and set the uh, distance from between 120 to 150 centimeters. We then measured all the distances and calibrated the needed initial velocity to reach the targets. Um, this is our human machine interface. It uses the Raspberry Pi motor controllers and encoders. It can calculate how far back to uh, bring back the bungees to hit our desired target. Actually, let's give you a demonstration. What's the height and distance? The distance is 10 meters and the height is one meter. All right, I'll plug that in. I'll load in the uh, bag and Maria will preload the cart. Now I can make fine adjustments with this encoder wheel, but right now it seems pretty good. All right, launching in three, two, one. Wow, nice shot. Good thing we have physics we couldn't miss. Here is the program we use. We use Python. Um, here we import the necessary packages and define our colors. Next, we program our global variables and we start with G. This is for calculating the graphics for our HMI that I mentioned earlier. Each one of these circles represents one tenth of a second. And the blue circle represents the target we're trying to hit. Um, This is how we program to calculate the stretch for all the trigonometry needed. We use Pygame for processing the keyboard inputs. And this is where we programmed our encoder wheel. The encoder wheel sends out uh, square, two square waves that we can use to determine the position of the motor. Um, and this is where we programmed the graphics for the HMI. I talked to my teacher and she said that it was awesome, this project. I spoke about it at my school too, and they said it would be a great way to learn these physics calculations such as Newton laws of motion. We thought that in the future, for if this were to be, um, used in classrooms it would be great if it were smaller and maybe a golf ball or a nerf ball could be used so it could be smaller and easier to use and this is a great project for uh classrooms to learn about physics in a fun way time's up uh any questions hmm this was nice this was nice guys i i really enjoyed the presentation uh, the way you guys were pulling up with the slides and interact, the interaction, the energy. Guys, I love it. This is not a question yet, but I just sort of, I couldn't hold it. I had to just give it to you. I really love it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank so you, much. you guys very much. Um, hello, I've got a couple questions. So um, what was the hardest part about programming your robot? Um, we probably the hardest part was um, we had to uh, we had to account for um, all sorts of different problems. Like for example, like this, the power was too strong, and so we had to improvise by creating um, more supports so that it wouldn't break. Like here, we had a lot of problems with the breaking and everything. So I think that was a big part. And. Um, we also had to uh, program the distances and uh, figure out how to uh, put calculations on and display them on the HMI. Hmm. 
Um, you mentioned the breaking thing. Uh, how, what kind of problems was that causing you? Um, well, originally the, uh, it was the cornhole rail gun was kind of acting like a slide hammer and it was hitting into the, uh, without the brakes and it was hitting into the end so hard that it was making the other end come apart. So we have clips there now, and now we have with some foam padding in between so it can absorb the energy. Okay. Um, last question. Why did you guys decide to go with a rail gun instead of something like a catapult? Um, it, um, we, we thought that um, it, like a catapult, we felt like, wouldn't have enough like it needed more force we felt so it um it also the catapult doesn't have as much accuracy this one is easier to uh change the angle on and to set the distance it's more accurate every okay time. so how would you change the angle how do you what's the process when doing that <clears throat> you uh loosen these collars and then you can um raise or lower this whole machine on the pvc pipes and then you measure the angle with a uh a level Alrighty, thank you. <clears throat> well, right. cornhole, oh, oh, just real quick, cornhole is a beloved game. Um, tell me about your teamwork where you're at different schools. How did you come together as a team? Well, um, I would come over here on some weekends. This is uh, my cousin and we've been doing robotics for a while. So I come over here on weekends and we would work on this project and uh, just uh, and it was fun. Okay, so has the robot ever gotten a perfect score? Um, yeah, we've played against the robot and it, it was pretty fun. And um, it, it has, um, it, it plays better than we, we can. It, it can't quite break, get a perfect score at the pro level, but it, it's pretty close. I mean, because pros, they like add different kinds of spin on it and they can uh, determine whether they want to block the hole or what they want. Okay, yeah, thank you. Great application for the classroom too. Thanks. Any other questions? So yeah, yeah. So we can wait off any invasion from or, or from the aliens, right? With this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For future application, we'll make a really big one. Okay. <laughs> All right. So how complex or confused? What will you say this project was to you guys? How complex? How difficult? Well, right now, um, I'm a sophomore, so I'm learning physics in school. So it was really interesting to see how like I was learning things in the classroom and learning, and then I was also applying it here. So I think I found it a little bit easier for me to learn, to um, apply the physics in order. The physics were a little bit harder for me since I'm only a freshman and I haven't learned physics yet, but it uh, definitely helped me. And I think it'll, it'll uh, help me in the future too. Good job guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to move you back into the panelists or attendees and I'm going to promote Eagle three. They're coming in so they can get everything set up. All right. Are we good? Whenever you are ready to start, go ahead and just start your presentation. I will start the timer when, when you go. All right. All right. Are you ready to start? Uh, no, no can you connect to it first? I know. Yeah. One second, we're connected to our drop. All right, sounds good. You're connected? Yeah, yeah. All right, you ready to hit run? I am. All right. So our project was an um, autonomous parking enforcement officer. Um, the people who go around and give you tickets in the big cities. And we wanted to automate that with a drone um, using AI and like open CV camera stuff in order to read the license plates. But want me to run? Yeah, run it. We only have so much time. I know. It takes a while to start it up because it has to initialize all of our variables and whatnot. So let's load the uh, object detection model. So it'll take a while to start up. All right. So um, we have a few statistics here on our poster board to really push home the fact that this is a necessary thing. And uh, oh, there she goes. 
That means the um, as the program starts, a recording thread starts up, and it will record a few a few frames at a time, and send that as record that as a video file in AVI specifically. And our saved video file gets sent to this computer right here, which will then read the video file, take the text out of the video file from the license plate, and then ideally two hours later, it'll go again, read the video again, and then it'll compare them. And if the, license, if the same license plate's there for two hours, that means the car's been in the same spot for two hours, which is over the extended limit. So then they get sent the ticket. Um, the reason we felt the need to do this with a drone, though, is because about 5% of all parking enforcement officers in the state of California, they get hit by a car, or they get beat up over their job, and we thought it was kind of a big problem. Um, and a drone doesn't have to worry about that, especially since you can't tell if the drone's giving you a ticket, because it's all automated in a camera. Um, so as you can see, yeah. the program has now started running through the ANPR or automatic number plate recognition. Let's see camera. if I can move the camera closer for you guys. Yeah, I don't know how well you're going to do it. But... Did you guys see that? No. no. No, it's already ended. It's already ended? Yeah. My apologies. Um, but what it did there is it pulled up the video and it drew a green box around the license plate to show we detected it. And it extracted the text. All right, and then they'll go again. I'll record a second video and then I'll land. And then I'll run this through the same. And then I'll run it through the same code again. Take the video, take the text out of the video. And then if the text matches, it'll, it'll print the print ticket. Um, this is the ticket we printed when we recorded the video last time. As an example. As an example. It's a different license plate than we want, the one we used here. Um, and you yeah, want to like explain the process though? The process. Like the code? Okay. So, after the video recorder thread records the actual AVI video file, or then run it through the object detection model that I train using TensorFlow. The object detection model will locate where the license plate is within the image and extract that region on the image. It will then take this region and actually run it through something called object character recognition, which will attempt to read the text off of the plate itself. Once we get this text, we will extract it from the list that it saves it as, and then we will print that on the terminal. As you can see, it's running through it right now. Time's up. Mm -hmm. Oh, time's up. Time's up. All right. Questions? <laughs> As you can see, so, I am wondering if you've tried this in the field. Um, yeah, that's why um, we got this height. This is the height of the car that we used it on and it has worked in the field it works with these cardboard printouts of license plates it works with photos of license plates it'll work with temporary license plates like the one they issue you at the dmv that's just paper and, and it'll work, work with the real deal we will work with that license plate as well okay thank you is there any other questions nope uh yeah i was um I was, I think you, you answered my question why you were answering hard. But I, I think I like the way you guys presented, especially you that is standing like a professor, the way you were sort of making things happen, you know? I kind of like the air around your presentations. But my only concern was that the, the poster was a little, it's a little bit uh, too faint for me to see. So please take the camera, I want to just- All right. Yeah, bring it closer to the camera. I want to see what. Yeah, can you help me hold this? Yes. All right. So let's bring this real close. Um, yeah, lower it, lower it a bit. So we have our title here, Autonomous Parking Enforcement Officer. We got, um, this is the picture of the video. You see it works with the phone as well. You want to zoom in a little bit so we can Yeah. 
Okay. Basically, what happened is he made an AI um, with yes. TensorFlow. He made his uh, an autonomic number plate recognition. Yeah, and he programmed it to read it and stuff like yourself, right? Yes. Yeah. I, I, I use something called uh, transfer learning, which basically takes a pre-trained model that TensorFlow already had and leveraged it with my own images and label files. So it could um, so it would specifically read license plates and read them very well. Awesome. Awesome. All right, man. Thanks, guys. So um, how long did it take you to program this robot? Okay, so um, what do you say about, I want to say 60 hours? It was a lot. It was total. But if talking about time it took from when we started, it was take about, took about a month. It took about a month working. Okay. About two and a half weeks for the ANPR model itself and getting the object character recognition to work. And it took another week, I want to say, just to yeah. for testing and debugging. Okay. So what was the hardest part about programming it? What was that? What, what gave you the most problems when you were trying to program it? Um, the AI with the um, automatic number plate recognition. It was very finicky at first until I had to retrain it once again. Mm -hmm. More license plate images and had to readjust the label files. Okay. And so what was the process of... gave us a lot of trouble um, because it uses its own module to program it. And I had to learn basically a whole new language because of this thing. Okay. operates on its own set of rules that's why we had to use multi-threading to keep it alive because it would if it's left alone for too long it just crashes oh really hmm. yeah so multi-threading was a whole other pain in its own yeah having it run simultaneously with or at least have it run in a, on a different thread to actually record the file yeah and then send it over hmm. in a different okay. instance. so how when did you realize you had to use multi-threading um, well, we finished the ANPR first, so it was that last week when we were debugging and testing, we were having a problem where the drone would take off and the second it tried to open the camera, it would drop. And after relentless debugging, we found out, oh, if we use multi-threading, we can keep it alive on one end and control it on the other, we then save it as a video file instead of keeping it live mm -hmm. to reduce the processing power because mm -hmm. it would overload the drone's little CPU and crash. Okay. All right. That's exactly why I have a GPU limiter set up on my program as well, because it takes so much processing power off of your laptop to run mm -hmm. this ANPR detection. That I said, I just set a limit cap to make sure my computer did not crash while running it. Oh wow! How much? How much uh, processing power did it end up using? Um, I, I I reset the timer to where it wouldn't actually stay up for that long, but I have the memory caps up to five thousand one hundred twenty memory, because it, it it uses up pretty quickly. Okay. All righty. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. Any other questions? Uh, I just wanted to ask what, how would you bring this to market? Like how close would you say this is to real implementation? Um, I'd say it's almost there. You stick a few variables in there so that people could alter it and um, a GUI so that it could be used by the average person. And I'd say you could bring it to market with uh, state officials right off the bat um, because they could use it for parking enforcement. That's the plan. Right. Nice application. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to promote Eagle 4 now to the panelists and move Eagle 3 back in to the auditorium. Whenever you then, begin your presentation, I will start the timer. Going so. to see, um, is there any way you guys could put in the other Eagle 4 account as panelists as well? Yep. The other Eagle 4 account or the Eagle 3 account? The Eagle 4 account. Is, um, what would that be named? Wait. Is that Mr. B or is that? I'm wondering what I'm named as in here because my 
phone is now equal four. Okay, so what would the other one be? What, what would I look for? Michael? Um, Michael. Michael, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, I see it. I see it, yep, I got gotcha. you. There we go, okay. those panelists. Okay, so I'm gonna start, I have the screen sharing up, but I'm gonna start on my phone just because of the introduction. Hello, my name is Michael C. I am here at the Eastlake Academy of Engineering. My team ID is 3549-4, and I am here to present current, which is an aerial medical delivery drone. So I'm gonna take the camera and you guys can hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. So I'm going to come over. And the problem that I've seen is that, which I don't know if this is readable. But yeah, I think uh, we stop the screen share so we can see the project better. Yeah. Okay. We got one. Let's see if it's on there. Stop the screen share. And then I'll re, re screen share. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Good. So there's a giant problem with um, traffic accidents in the US and Florida is definitely one of the higher states with um, driving and traffic accidents in general, but especially uh, fatal accidents. It's not common every day to see um, some kind of crazy accident that's happened on I-4 or US-19, which are two major, two extremely major roads in Florida. And a lot of those accidents lead to uncontrollable hemorrhage, which makes up 30% of total traffic fatalities. These are all problems that could be mitigated through some kind of device that could arrive before ambulances do, because the problem with car accidents is that they cause a giant traffic backup, which may cause the ambulance to arrive later and could result in some kind of loss of life. So I've implemented a drone that is um, in concept supposed to arrive before the police, but not the police, the ambulance does. So it would arrive with a um, first aid kit or a defibrillator, depending on what's going on at the moment, so that it could be used with either cardiovascular problems or blood loss. Um, the STEM principles that um, this concept takes advantage of is kinematics, control system theory, image processing, neural networks, and artificial intelligence. And then I also created a mock instruction manual for the drone because um, it once it arrives at the scene, the main problem is that an area of a car accident or an, even the neighborhood in general, if someone's suffering from a heart attack, let's say, in their neighborhood, is that there might be debris, there might be mailboxes, there's obstacles. So the drone will arrive at the rough location using um, a street address, which means it would travel down the street at a higher altitude. And then it would basically just arrive on the scene and then that bystander who called 911 would be responsible for um, using a simple to understand UI to um, pilot the drone to a safer landing spot. So I have had the drone. So you wait for it to hover and then you use your hand to control it. And it's just open or close to make the drone follow or make it hover. I also created a little Spanish um, under text because Spanish is a pretty, um, pretty prominent language in Florida and it's definitely the second highest spoken language in Florida. So it's important that um, almost everyone knows how to use it in the case of an emergency. So I'm going to pull my screen share up. All right, so, oh, okay. What is, this isn't good. It seems like it's flashing when I try to screen share. 
We can see okay, your screen. I think, I think it's fixed. Yeah, but oh man. It's not. Yeah. As soon as I uh, share my screen, it seems to flash. Like on, it seems to flash on and off. So I think I, I'll try and show the code later. If I can, I'm just going to go straight into the demonstration. And then I'll also try and explain um, pseudocode if I can as I'm demonstrating. So I think my laptop's going to disconnect from Zoom in a second. Because I'll be connecting to the drone's Wi-Fi in order to um, log into it using UDP. While you're waiting, um, if we could go ahead and have judges um, ask questions while you're waiting for that to, to load. Absolutely. Um, so judges, if you would like to ask a question now during this downtime for him, go ahead. Um, so interesting idea. Um, how did you come up with the uh, idea to use hand gestures as the main way to control the robot? So it's been a passion project of mine for a while. Um, and it's always um, been kind of like an idea to control the drone with the hand. And originally, um, I did use hand gestures, but the main problem was that using multiple gestures um, made it very hard to remember, even for someone who made it, to remember what all these gestures would do. I would do like four, four for forward, three for backward. I would do this for left and this for right. And it would just got um, kind of hairy at times, like trying to keep the drone from hitting a wall or something while also remembering like, wait, I have to do this because it's not the most intuitive thing in the world. Mm -hmm. So um, I ended up taking that concept that I did early in the year and um, trying to um, hone in on the user interface portion. And so that's where I came to the idea that what's more simple than opening and closing a hand. And so the drone is connected now. If I would like to demonstrate, go ahead and move the laptop kind of over here and move this. Um, I don't, I don't think I can. I don't want to mess with the uh, screen share right now because it's flashing on and off, but and then I'm going to bring the laptop over really quick because there is wait. Let me check something. Pam or Destiny, do you have a question while he's working oh, on Oh, there we the go. Okay. Okay. So I first made a uh, prompt because there have been many times while um, programming this where I accidentally click run or I accidentally run on the wrong program, which is this program. And the drone just starts flying and taking off and mayhem ensues if um, preparations aren't made. So I have created a little prompt. So if I press backspace, it's just gonna close out of the code and nothing will happen. Relief will be kind of emanated that we didn't have like a false start. But if I press space, the program will start. And I'm going to start with my closed hand in front, as the instruction manual said. And the CB2 window takes about five to 10 seconds to load up, but now it is loaded up. I'm gonna open it, it's gonna come a little closer. I'm gonna have it do cardinal directions. So it's moving up right now. I'm gonna hold it down. 
Not gonna make it travel downward. And then, you know, I'm not comfortable with this close space. It's too close to me. So I'm gonna use kind of force here, make it travel backwards in the Z direction. And then we'll do right and left, right, left. And then you can also do combinations because it works um, as a uh, full velocity vector matrix. So I can make it go diagonal. Let's do, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try bottom left and back and see if it, yep. So it comes down, it comes left and it comes forward. So now I'm gonna prime it for landing, make it hover and I'm gonna land it on this table. Needs a little bit more. Okay. So now I have thumbs down countdown. So it's gonna count down from five. And then if I flip my thumb up, it's not gonna land. So this was a problem last time where it would instantly land if I put my thumb down. And sometimes the uh, hand detection wouldn't be perfect if the drone was moving and that would cause it to land spontaneously. But now it has a countdown from five, four, three, two, one. And then my hand is not in screen, but five, four, there we go. And that is the demonstration. Jud uh, judges, do you have any other questions? So how can... long did it take you to program uh, the hand detection and all this? Um, or wait. The hand detection was something that we already covered um, last year. So training and um, validating artificial intelligence uh, databases wasn't exactly out of our reach. It was, it was definitely more of the uh, the drone part, <laughs> mm -hmm. if anything, than the AI part. But this took upwards of the beginning of the school year to now, just mm -hmm. from uh, like kind of a concept in the brain to uh, reality. But I definitely had problems with, I guess, start like finding out where to start off and what kind of um, things I should use, what kind of programs I should use to run the model itself. Okay. Um, I tried, I tried uh, color distortion, morphism, and I also tried um, just more simpler CV2 uh, canny options, but those just drew bounding boxes around the hand. And I definitely wanted something more specific at the time because I wanted to do gestures. And that's when I landed on uh, media pipe which draws coordinate points based on your model at each joint in the hand. And I still use that for this project because I could optimize it and I could, um, it had a lot of modularity to it. Mm -hmm. So I could kind of dive into the uh, class area and try and uh, make it run a little faster, especially when it comes to the fact that um, as Eagle 3 said, if you don't uh, constantly send the drone commands, it is going to land. So if it's not doing anything, it's constantly being sent um, 0, 0, 0, 0 for X, Y, Z and yaw velocities, just to make sure that it is not going to uh, shut off spontaneously. Mm -hmm. So you also mentioned that the drone itself was hard to program? Yeah, the drone itself had some <laughs> um, interesting quirks about it. Um, one thing was the uh, automatic altitude sensor inside it. Uh, no matter if you're using it through um, the app that it usually comes with, or if you're actually just hacking into it with Python, it, that automatic altitude sensor always is on and there's no way to disable it. So um, in like a classroom setting with table, with tables and chairs and other obstacles, um, that definitely showed to be a bit of a mess. And then if the drone, if you started up the drone on like a program where it was just meant to take off and you haven't written anything yet or got deleted, you would have to basically grab it by the guards and flip it over because that instantly turns it off. Oh, okay. 
Okay, judges, we're going to have to move on. Um, if you have any additional questions, we will email them to you for response. So at this time, I'm going to move Eagle Four out of the panelist view and move in um, Collegio CESJ5 SES from Hong Kong. Whenever you are ready to start, I will start the timer. So just go ahead and start your presentation when you're ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's okay. Um, All right, it's okay. Let's, all right, let's go. So we'll hear about this later. <laughs> okay. All right. Very good. Uh, hello, judges. Um, we are students from CDSJ5 from Macau. My name is Mario. My name is Wilson Chen. I'm Wilson Lai. My name is Brian Guo. Wei Feng. So um, because uh, the Macau government is still enforcing the zero COVID law. So uh, right now, um, when you come to Macau, you have to stay in quarantine facilities. So um, in this phenomenon, these facilities accommodate people with risk of carrying viruses. So this means, uh, the staff working inside may have a high risk of infecting these viruses. So to minimize the contact between the staff and the inhabitants, we came up with an idea of using robots to replace duties, which uh, require most contact uh, with the patients. So uh, for example, uh, delivering food and cleaning up rubbish in this case. So let's start the demonstration. Uh, as we can see that we, there are three rooms and the remote controls for each of them. Now, firstly, we will have the delivering food to the room one. For the, to start the robot, we will, we will need to press the buttons on the, on the remote controls first. And then we will we can we will not need to slot the delivery foods. And now the robot is going to the rooms once and for given the foods for the user to wait them to taking in. While the robot is serving this uh, the rooms, the other remote controls are disabled. So the next users need to raise the robot to finish their own uh, current task first. Now the robot will return back to the standby. So let me explain a little bit. So actually we are simulating a, a situation where there are multiple rooms. And in this case, there are three rooms in this site. Um, so there, there is one remote control inside each of these rooms for the user to use the robot. And now we have a second scenario. So as you can see here, we have a bag of rubbish in room two and it's waiting for the robot to collect it. So here we have a close up of the remote control room two. And now we select um, collect rubbish. Um, um, so now let's start it over again.
So now it's going to room two. Okay, so that's all we have for our presentation. Thank you for listening. Judges, do you have questions? Yes, I do. Guys, thanks for the presentation. Um, what, what will you say is um, maybe some kind of training you've got maybe from mathematics, physics, um, computer science that you use in this project? Um, so in this project, we the most important feature we use is Bluetooth connection and a series of logic processes. So for example, so those three remote controls are actually connected to the robots by Bluetooth. And, and there are some logic that and variables that has to be used to determine um, which room should the robot go to. And and what the action should the robot do. So for example, if it's delivering food, then, then other remote controls cannot do anything when the robot is in motion. And, and the robot must make sure that it is delivering food, not doing another action. So uh, who, who is supposed to do the programming? Like who, who will instruct the a robot to move and do a particular uh, um, activity? Is it the, the, um, the patient or the administrator? So, so if you mean by who, who controls the robot to move, so it's actually the user who uses the remote control. Um, he can just make the robot move by pressing um, a button to instruct what the robot um, should do. And then the robot will automatically go to the, the specified location. Okay. How, how far, sorry, I think I'm taking all the questions. How far can the Wi-Fi connection go? So in this case is, is so the site is only about uh, a few meters long, but actually I think it can reach about more than 10 to 15 meters. All right, thank you. So you have an impressive group there. There's five of you. So how was it? Who did what? Was it hard coming to a um, agreement on what you were gonna do? Um, sometimes, so, so actually, um, at first we have to practice um, how to master using this robot and, and just um, try to cooperate well to distribute uh, different work um, efficiently. Okay, well, you showed very well. Congratulations. Thank you. Any other questions we'll have to send through email. We need to move on to the next group. Thank you. Thank you. Whenever you're ready, go ahead and start. Yes, yes we are ready. ready. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Good morning, everyone. We are PL KCL SCMC Robotic Team 1 from Poland Centenary Lee Chong Memorial College. And this is our design, the ping pong ball washing machine. It's our honor to present these details to you all. This is Anki. This is Andrew. This is Freda. 
Inspired by the restrictions in table tennis competition at 2020 Tokyo Summer Olympics, we designed this machine for table tennis athletes since it can assist the organization of table tennis competition and solve the hygienic problems associated with COVID-19. Our aim is to eliminate the obstacles concerning the disinfection and cleaning issues of sports equipment that have retarded the progress of sports promotions. Let's demonstrate how our machine operates. When the switch is turned on, two servos will control the arm with a basket containing the table tennis balls to return to its original position. The, all the data will be reset. Uh, the movement of the arm is controlled by the cooperation of two servos. One, one is for uh, horizontal movement and one is for vertical movement. The table tennis balls will be soaked into baking soda solution and battle respectively. After pressing on the start stop button, the LCD monitor will display all the necessary statistics, including model information, pH status, number of balls added, and humidity of the fan box. The weight sensor is used to measure the number of balls in order to prevent overload or the situation that no ball is put before the soaking procedure starts. The procedure will only start when the weight sensor measures one to six balls. The humidity in the fan box is sensed below 80%, and the pH of the baking soda is measured alkaline. The pH meter is installed to monitor the pH value of the baking soda. Baking soda is used for removing grises and dirt, while the table tennis balls are soaked into dildo for the elimination of virus and bacteria. The table tennis will be eventually carried to the fan box for drying. We have attached the heating tubes to the fan so that a more ideal drying temperature can be provided. The drying process will be finished when the humidity has decreased by 5%. After the table tennis balls are dried up, the arm will carry them back to their original position. We use Arduino as our programming app. Concerning the weight sensor, we created a few algebra to let the sensor automatically deduct the weight of the basket at the start of the procedure, no matter how heavy the basket is. Therefore, the machine can still measure the number of balls despite the actual weight for the position of the basket. So now let's introduce our program for the dual structure. If the final humidity is lower than the initial one by 5%, the fan and heating tube will stop working and the basket will return to its base. Otherwise, the fan and heating tube will keep working and measuring the humidity every second until the requirements for returning to the base are satisfied. We have also installed a button. If the measured pH is not alkaline or if the number of balls add in is no or more than six, it will not be suitable for the machine to start. It will be displayed on the LCD monitor to remind you to change another tank of solution or check if there are, there are suitable amount of balls added. If you still want to start the progress, you can press the button again to start anyway. But better demonstration of the returning progress, we will now accelerate the drying procedure of the table tennis balls by drying it artificially. Our components, including the fan box, the containers, and the arms, are created by 3D printing techniques. We first wrap it out our design, and then, and then we printed it out with a 3D printer. Our other components are created by cutting archaic boards into, into a required shape by laser cutter. This is all of our presentation. Thank you for listening. For questions and answers? So, um, okay. yeah. Oh, John, go ahead, please. Go ahead, Destiny. No, no go ahead, John. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so, um, how did you come up with 5% humidity being necessary for optimal drying? Um, because we have measured it for uh, several times, and after a few experiments, we tried 2%, 3%, and 4%, just in similar ranges. And we found out that 5%, after the humidity of the sensor in the fan box has decreased by 5%, the table tennis balls are nearly all dried. So we take this value in our program. Thank you for Thank you. Thank you. John, time so. Hey guys, this was a good one. This was good. Um, so, did we see the demonstration of the project apart from the drying? Did we? Did you play or did you? What? Where, where's the sport activity here? Like, I'm trying to find where the sport stuff comes in. Oh, mainly we use table tennis for uh, the South project. 
project target because it's small enough and it is easy to do our experiments on. But with further development, instead, many of the other sports can be used in our program for disinfection, such as um, tennis sports or golf balls, badminton balls, or even not sports, non sports equipment, such as some tablewares in restaurants or hands used in public examination sites, can be used as the target of this disinfection machines. Okay, so okay, disinfection. All right, thanks, thanks. Uh, one last quick question Can you tell me about your QR code? Yes. Yes. You can. Uh, do you want to know the contents of the QR code shown inside the. Uh, uh, like how would you use the QR code? Well, the QR code is our. It's our poster video and uh, it's all our content of our yes, machine. Yes. Yes. So maybe oh. you can scan it and look for it. Okay, one quick, one quick question, please. What is the, where is the, the, what empowered you to do this? Like your mathematical background, computational background, physics background, chemistry, biology, which, what, which area? Uh, our, our sports teacher actually complained about the problem in the, this pandemic that they cannot play play this table tennis uh, very conveniently because of the the policy that our government uh, broadcasted. Uh, we need to have some disinfection machines for cleaning the table tennis balls. So in this machine, we use um, we in fact applied some biological knowledge such as the baking soda and the dental solution. The baking so the solution can clean some can clear away the dust and greases attached on the table tennis balls and the data solution can just eliminate the viruses furthermore for physical knowledge application in the in the fan box in fact we we have some heating panels so that to increase the temperature inside the fan box for better drying thanks thank you very nice, thank you. Well, we're going to come in with our last team. Um, we're gonna promote. Thirty-seven one three 13-1. You need to accept the panelist up invitation in order to bring you over to the panelist side from the attendee side. Is there a different device that we should bring over? You are, um, are there a different device? I know sometimes when you log off and log back in, here, let me bring you over, Dania. <clears throat> Sometimes it renames you back to your original and I can't find you, so. You found the one though, right? The... Well, there's two, there's Dania and there's a camera device. Right. And I, I've, 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 okay. I've promoted them to panelists a couple of okay. yeah, you have to actually accept. 
the invitation to become a panelist. Okay, here we go. Okay, good. There we go. Okay. Hello, okay. can you hear us? Is, there, is everything clear? We can hear you. Okay. Oh, one second. The camera has flipped. <laughs> one second. Whenever you're ready to start, just go ahead and I will start the timer. This is our last presentation of the day. Thank you all for joining us. Well, when you're finished, go ahead. Um, we'll have some announcements and wrap up, but go ahead um, whenever you're ready. Okay, so first of all, uh, we just, we'd like to introduce ourselves. My name is Tamaha Nassar, and I'm the team's graphic designer, Lego, a builder, and robotics engineer. I'm Radima Wandi. I'm a graphic designer, researcher, and a programmer. I'm Liad Khalid, and I am the engineering and the mechanical of the vehicle and the prototype. Uh, and our lovely coach is Dani Basahi. Uh, we, we love to thank her for helping us uh, throughout our technical difficulties. Um, Assalamu alaikum, first of all. Hope you all are having a great day. And I'd like, uh, as we introduce you to our names, we'd like to introduce you to the meaning behind um, our prototype's theme or the entire project. So, yeah, can you please bring me uh, uh, So, the reason behind its name and mostly its shaping and design overall is be uh, because of an ancient monster uh, called Gigantros. A, it's a gigantic most monster that uh, legendary cannot be defeated unless put to sleep uh, because of how powerful it is. Uh, as well as the name gigantic, which means other than uh, strength and prominence, means uh, the unusual or exceeds the usual. And we can also add to that uh, our team name, which is uh, Gigantros. Uh, adding the row uh, kind of means the, uh, the successes in a row that our team will hopefully be achieving. And that's how we get our team name and our deep. Um, we'd love to introduce you to our uh, research problem and how we solved it. Uh, Danny, can you move the camera with me, please? Can you flip the camera so you can see better? Can you stop the screen share for just a moment so we can see your, your demonstration up close? Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, as you uh, as you already know, uh, we had an accident with our project, and this is what we kind of had to do. <laughs> so first of all, uh, I'd like to zoom in on our little city right here and um, talk about our problem. Our problem is actually um, the usage of fossil fuels and uh, natural gas and other uh, non-renewable harmful uh, materials in sea transportation and how we can badly pollute uh, the sea and make it harder for marine uh, investigations in future scientific research. So. Um, as well as the long duration it takes uh, cargo and sea transportation to be, which mostly um, has led us to unnecessary human resources consumption, such, such as excessive food, excessive oils, and other things that we can really cut off on. So uh, what we did to try and solve it is we created a fully automated um, seaport that uses uh, renewable energy sources, such as the ones displayed right here. Uh, here we have three types of renewable energy sources. Uh, we First of all, we have hydroelectric power, um, and I'll talk about the other one while the power is on. Uh, we have also solar power and wind, en uh, wind energy represented right here. Uh, yeah, uh, now we will share the screen because uh, our sun has set in where we are. It's not, it hasn't set, but it's not powerful enough for the solar cells. So here the solar station power um, uses Lego renewable energy kit solar cells to power a motor just to show uh, that it can be used as kinetic energy for future uses. Um, is the screen share there? One sec. Okay, uh, so this is a representation of its movement in the sun. Uh, and now moving on to the other energy types. We have uh, wind energy using turbines here uh, and this uh, Heron's fountain using physics mechanisms. Uh, 
this Mr. Haslab Kotanat, I went here. Uh, this uses um, conservation of and conversation of kinetic energy to potential energy and water systems to be able to uh, produce a fountain to power this uh, lovely device. Um, and this, in its turn, shows us um, how we can use hydroelectric power to move things such as this hydraulic lift right here for this house. Um, and then moving on to talk about our marine system and um, the transportation vehicle system right here. So the, uh, the, the vehicle transportation systems starts with, uh, starts upon the launch of the uh, artificially art artificially intelligence uh, drones. Uh, that speci specify the optimal route uh, for the self-driving car, uh, the, for the self-driving vehicle, uh, to find uh, the perfect destination. After, uh, after that, uh, it goes with that path to the, sea, uh, the, to the smart seaport uh, and the designated destination. Uh, when, he get to, when it gets to the uh, smart seaport, which is uh, represented in this uh, in model. In this model, um, the vehicle uh, like this uh, starts here. The sensor the de detect its presence and moves it into the garage. Uh, after, after that, there uh, starts a collaboration a collaboration between artificial intelligence and uh, Internet of Things. Uh, to check the uh, vehicle condition. After that, send the report to the operation manager. So uh, as you can see, we had a working prototype before, but after the water incident, the sensors are no longer working. So this will not be powering today. Uh, what will this be is the garage, by the way. It was like moving and opening and closing like this. Uh, and what we'll be moving today is our prototype. Uh, and since our little pool wasn't working before, we're gonna use the house's entire pool. So hopefully that's better. Okay, and now I'm gonna talk about the vehicle. Uh, the, the real vehicle can use in more one, and then more than one field. We can use it in uh, travel and transport and entertainment and tourism, marine rescue and search and exploration. And it has two powerful, compact, high-speed electric motors and, co and can go, go to uh, 2,000 horsepower. And the battery has capacity for, for 4,000 kilowatt non static battery. And now we're going to show you the um, prototype. Can you hold on? The vehicle's design is used to be um, streamlined and to resist um, fluid movements so for optimal speed. Can you tell us a, bit, a little bit about its motors and how it works? Okay, it's had a uh, motor and a servo. Uh, it, had, um, it has a um, battery, it's uh, seven volt. And uh, the servo can uh, control seven, um, not three minutes, uh, three channels and control all the things inside. And that's it. Uh, here we have a Lego prototype that we built before the actual one. Uh, and that was used in our previous um, design but now we've upgraded to this one. Um, we are done now. And if you have any questions, uh, please do ask. Thanks, Kat. Oh, I, I, should, I should say beautiful ladies. Thank you so much. Beautiful, intelligent ladies. That is awesome. Thank you so much. So this um, system you have, is controlled from the tower, or, or does it? I mean, the tower means the base. Is it controlled from the base? You're on mute. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the tower, the tower is actually a um, marine system that's used for um, navigation, mostly for the vehicle. Um, the actual controlling system is in the garage, and the transportation system in. Um, the wheels of the, the system from before. Okay, so um, the, 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 uh, let me call it a robot. The robot is able to make decisions while in the water, right? Yeah, it, um, the drone that is accompanied by it actually flies 
alongside the vehicle and then it can detect the best route for optimal um, the station reach and lower accidents by uh, other types of uh, objects in this way. So, so we have two system in one. Yes. yes. So if if I'm going to on a cruise, this robot is always hovering a lot around us, and then the cruise is going and the 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 the, the, the what do you call it? Yeah, is the the drone is hovering over us, right? Yeah, I can have some stops uh, for recharging, of course, but yeah, its main focus is to optimize route detection for the vehicle. So if, just in case, if the drone has issue, it means we that are cruising are in trouble, right? Um, no, yeah. actually, the, the cruise actually has a preset path that is um, kind of average for every ship to go in when it's, when it's trying to reach, reach that destination. The okay. drone's um, job is to offer additional help to it. So uh, if there's a storm, if there's um, an unexpected iceberg, if there's anything else like that in its way, it can actually navigate around it and help reach the passengers and the cargo safely. Okay, so there's a default route somewhere. Because I, I don't want to get lost in the sea, so now I'm, I'm, more, com I'm more convinced. Now, the next question is, which of... What sort of empowered you to do this? Is it the mathematical skills you ladies have, or is it the physics intelligence? What sort of what what which of the area of science empowered you to do this? Uh, first of all, pardon me for answering most of the questions, as my friends here are not um, fluent in English, so I'm trying to kind of help around here. Um, <laughs> but like we, we do have very very good teamwork actually. So actually, um, the idea to work in our pro um, to use the um, this problem and solve it actually came from our um, unique abilities. So she Eliada here can very do great job with motors and robots and can create amazing prototypes as the one you, you saw before. Uh, Renim here is a great programmer and robot builder, uh, and we both graphic design and do research for the team. So first of all, we tried to come up with uh, a great background for the idea. Um, so our idea got inspired of two different things. So first of all, uh, the legendary monster, as we said before. And second of all, uh, we found actually that Tesla uses very similar um, navigation systems and motor uses and mechanisms uh, for its vehicles. Uh, and we related that ocean uh, and sea transportation share many of the same issues that land transportation did before Tesla existed. So uh, we thought to ourselves, why don't we apply similar uh, ideas to sea transportation to optimize that as well. Thank you. Okay, do you have questions or should we follow up with emails and keep moving? I mean, we're at time right now. <clears throat> I just want to quickly say congratulations for persevering. Uh, Thank you. So very, sometimes that happens, right? That's how progress happens is things fall apart and then we just keep moving on. So good job persevering. Thank you very much. Okay, if the judges have any additional questions, we will send emails to the coach. Um, sure. Thank you very much. So thank at you for this having time, us. Um, we're going to, should we put everyone back in attendees? Elmer? Yeah, sure. Sure, you, okay. Is, is that okay? Yep. Okay, why don't you bring everyone in? We'll just uh, make some concluding uh, comments. Yeah, so um, yeah, again, yeah, thank you to all the teams. Uh, as you see, it's quite the challenge, not only for the projects themselves, right? But um, having to do a live presentation and then having to work through all the challenges of uh, doing things online. So all teams did an outstanding job. Um, as, um, as Shannon said, uh, teams may receive follow-up questions by email and then they'll have approximately 24 hours to respond. And then after that, the judges will finalize their, um, their judging and the results will be uh, announced at the online um, World Championship Closing Ceremony on May 21st. Uh, details or uh, how to join her on the, our website. So please join us for that. And I think uh, we're up to the point for some closing remarks from um, Dr. Cartwright. So let's bring him on. Okay. Uh, thank you, Elmer. <laughs> okay. uh, so I'm Chris Cartwright. 
uh, director of RoboFest. Uh, thank, thank you everyone so much for your participation in this online format of RoboFest competition using real robots. I'd like to thank all the coaches, mentors, parents, students, and judges. Uh, special kudos to the RoboFest staff, uh, Shannon, Elmer, and Pam. I was impressed today uh, by all the creative applications of robots to uh, various uh, challenges in the 21st century. Uh, for instance, using things like uh, vision sensors, Wi-Fi communication, uh, physics, uh, drones, text extraction, artificial intelligence, uh, food delivery and rubbish collection, um, disinfecting table tennis balls, and smart cities with renewable energy and autonomous vehicles. Uh, again, everyone deserves a round of applause. So uh, we'll see everyone on May 21st at the closing and award ceremony. Uh, goodbye. All right, thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> Good job. So impressive. Thank you. Good thank job. you, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> Have a great day. Bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Damn, you're going to be promoted to a pilot soon. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you. It must be warm in Florida. Is it warm in Florida wearing a tank top? And Well, it's warm in Florida. I was supposed to be in the gym. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to have to miss the gym. <laughs> oh, working my body instead of my brain. <laughs> Not much left. <laughs> We're fighting gravity, so there yes. you go. Oh, that was an awesome presentation. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I was hooked. I couldn't even text. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. Yeah, yeah the yeah. judging is gonna be Yeah, it's gonna be tough. Yep. <laughs> yes. Yes. Be yes. Is, um, oh, I think lost Dusty already, but Yes, yeah. uh, semi. I'll, I'll send out the follow-up questions um this evening. So you have some. This is to me. Oh, thank God I'm not a judge. <laughs> yeah, I, I was actually pretty happy with all the with most of the live presentations, especially from oh, yeah. some of the things. I, I was really happy with what I saw. Yeah, yeah. they really oh, yeah. had to go through some hoops to do the presentation. Yeah, yeah no, it's like <laughs> very sophisticated stuff. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. But Mr. B, he is he is like a child in a candy store. <laughs> yeah. No, it's great to have them uh, join us. Yeah. Yes. Very, yes. very impressive. Well, thanks, CJ, for connecting Mr. B to Florida. Okay. He went out of retirement into the classroom. There you go. <laughs> yep. Have a nice weekend, Dr. Rom. Okay. All right. Thank okay, we're, we're gonna we're gonna sign off then. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye, John. Bye, Emma. Bye, bye, everybody. everybody. Bye. Yeah, thank you, John. Have a good weekend, everybody. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone. See you nice. tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Bye. -bye.